Oh, four. That's pretty good, don't you think? Uh, Even about, better. Is that better? <laughs> okay. You ready to go? Oh yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Listen. Can you hear microphones. me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's do this. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, my name is Eli Storch. I'm the chair of the Design Advocacy Group. Uh, thank you, David, for being here today. Oh, no, thanks for the invitation. So, uh, just before we get started, a little DAG business. Um, Everything's now on our website. So whether it's a Zoom or an in-person, we have recordings. So you can go back and watch uh, our last uh, events and going back about three years now. So there is a lot of good content there um, to check out. Uh, our next events are November the 2nd. We'll be back in this space at six o'clock with Anne Fadulin going through a, a, a fireside chat exit interview on her time um, planning department. And then, uh, It'll be December 14th. Uh, we are gonna be a morning, 10 o'clock. Uh, oh, we are starting early, 9.30. Thank you, Marcia. Um, talking about the parkway and the, the future plans and designs for the parkway. So you can register for all of that on our website, designadvocacy.org. And then we do our financial plug because it's the end of the year and we're trying to raise a few bucks because I'll, I'll gesture to the, the camera as I do this. Um, some of the websites that are usually free for us are now not. So anything helps in uh, supporting what we're doing advocacy wise and with these meetings is, is very helpful. So appreciate everybody's contributions to date. And uh, from there, let's jump into it. So I'm gonna introduce Andy Toy, who has been in and around DAG for many, many years, including uh, being a former steering committee member, uh, currently the policy director at PACDC. He's going to moderate. He's going to run this show. So I'll let you take it away. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Um, so did, we, did you want to introduce David or should I? That's you. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you all for coming. We have a huge crowd here today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Interested people. And, and thank you for coming. And I know it's being recorded, so we'll, other people will see this. Uh, first of all, I'm Andy Toy, not to be confused with David O., David's on this side, I'm on this side. Uh, we have been confused. People have asked me, are you David O? And I'm like, mm, not really. Um, I have gotten a few more votes. People thought I was Andy Toy. Oh <laughs> well, yeah, all right, I'll give you that, I'll give you that. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, we've, we've known each other a long time. David uh, has been a city councilman for- 11 years. A, you know, almost 12 years. Yeah, again, almost 12, yeah. As he dropped to, to run for uh, mayor. Yeah. Um, and uh, we actually ran and won a, in a race together, I believe, yeah. at, uh, yep. at some point. Yeah. And you won. I didn't. But that's, that's good. Yeah. good for you. Um, and David's been a, a, a friend and, and really somebody I've known for a long time uh, who's been a supporter of a lot of, a lot of issues. And well, I know we're talking about design here, but a lot of issues that, uh, where people didn't have a voice and sometimes um, needed a voice. And I think you've helped stand up for that. And I appreciate that. Um, so we can get right into it. Um, did you want to say anything about yourself before no, we start? No, no. I'm a councilman. I was for 11 years, uh, born and raised in Philadelphia. I'm an attorney by trade, and I kind of fell into politics, and then I resigned in February to run for mayor. And uh, the election is coming up in a few weeks, yes. so everybody should get out and vote, um, and more information is better, so that's why we're doing this. And... Um, our conversation today will be focused on the elements of design and planning in Philadelphia and how that can be impactful in our daily lives and in our communities, and then the broader uh, impacts around equity and the built environment in our great city. Um, so I'd ask everyone here to show respect, even if our views differ. Um, we're not always on the same page, all of us, and uh, that we try not to stray too far from design and planning and equity for the framing of this particular conversation, because you've been in many different conversations, but this is about design and planning. And, um, and I come from this having worked in government and also from the community development world. Um, and how do we support progress, but ensure equity and not forget what makes Philadelphia great. So that's kind of the, the big picture that we're trying to get to here. Um, so I'll start with a, a little con context for you, from you. Philly is known as a city of neighborhoods, which is often thought of as a good thing, but perhaps there are downsides to our being on isolated islands. Take us, take us to the neighborhood where you live or where you grew up, 
tell us what you like and maybe don't like about its built environment, the houses, the public buildings, streets, sidewalks, and the parks and public spaces. And what do you feel works well and maybe doesn't work so well? Yeah, so that's a tough question for me because there's not a lot to like in my neighborhood, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> but there I am. I've been there a long time. So, so why is that? Well, uh, I live in uh, King Sessing, right around um, 58th and Whitby, or you'd say 58th and Baltimore. And, and it's always had a lot of crime. Uh, there's always been a lot of issues. Uh, when I was young, um, you know, I, I, I remember we moved onto the block and um, <clears throat> it did change. I didn't notice the change, uh, but every year my friends would not come back to school. And the next year, more friends wouldn't come back to school. Well, it was white flight. You know, my friends were gone and new friends. You know, just had it. How would I know as a child? I was just thinking that was kind of normal. Um, but with that came a lot of poverty and issues. And of course, that was around 1968, 72. We had a big gang war problem in the city and in Southwest Philadelphia, there was a lot of that going on. And it is different than today, but in some ways it's the same, 13 year olds killing each other, you know, uh, for no really understandable reason. In those days, it's because people separated into gangs and they had conflicts and they ended up hurting each other or killing each other. Um, <clears throat> And, um, you know, my father, uh, he moved there, uh, you know, he started a church, actually. He came from Korea. There was a lot of issues in Korea prior to World War II, World War II, the Korean War. So he was immersed in death and uh, all kinds of, um, you know, major problems. And, uh, and so he lived there with his church and community center and spent a lot of time devoted to his church. And uh, I um, was not one of the bright kids in our family. And uh, I really struggled with school. I had a hard time, you know, uh, and, uh, and um, I just kind of uh, got involved with my friends. My friends got in a lot of trouble. I got in a lot of trouble. And um, well, my father was not happy with me. And, uh, you know, he would get to lecturing as fathers do. And, uh, you know, and, and I would kind of retort, um, well, this is kind of your fault because I'm the product of my environment, which why in the world would you move here? Like you have many choices, but why are you here? And his response was, this is a God blessed neighborhood. And, and I always felt like that was an interesting answer. Like at night they would, break the church windows and we had this big alarm <laughs> and wake up the whole day and we run out to see what's going on. There was always some mischief or problem or some type, you know, there was always crime going on. And uh, his response was always, this is a God blessed neighborhood. And he was so sincere when he said it. And uh, I just thought, oh, what nonsense, right? Um, but years and years later, as I reflected on it and learned more about his life, I, I thought, yeah, you know, to him, having gone through everything he went through, the wars and all that, he, he ended up in Southwest Philly, Philly. He didn't intend to be a pastor, started his church in 53, uh, dealt with the murder of his nephew who was living with him in 58 and dedicated uh, you know, his church. And, and to him, this was a real opportunity and he just felt this was a blessing. And he kind of said this, um, that... Um, Good people should stay in neighborhoods to make sure they're good. And he would go out and pick up the trash and do all that. So we'd have to help him, of course. And, you know, the building was old. Everything was broken. We'd have to fix up stuff. But much later, I really uh, felt that uh, the blessing was the people. There are great people. There are wonderful people. There are wonderful children. They're just stuck in a bad circumstance of poor education, poverty, crime, and they, they want to have a better life. And they're wonderful people. If they could get, get a break, mm -hmm. they could see the light of day. And, 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 and so to me, as I continue to live on the same block with my wife and four kids, you know, it is, it is just the reality of Philadelphia, the reality of life that, you know, there are people who through no fault of their own, um, they just live under very difficult circumstances. And I wonder where is the government? Where is the school? Where is the library? Where is the opportunity 
where is the clean streets? Where mm -hmm. is the respect for the community, the neighborhood, the, the people? And, and I think um, all in all, what I like about, now, what do I like about the community? I like the people. And if you look at the community without looking at all the problems, you would see that we live right next to Cobbs Creek Park. And, and if it was safe, and if people didn't dump in it, and if the, the play sets weren't like uh, left to, to deteriorate, It'd be a fantastic place. And when I was a kid, we'd go to the, the creek and find little things in there, alive things. I think they were tadpoles, I'm not sure. And we played the sandbox and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it that went... tells us about the importance of a park. Sure. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Listen, the park is great as long as it's safe and people will go into it. Um, and and um, and uh, yeah, there's a school down the street, Longstrap. There's a library, um, there's a shopping area. And I, I think it has everything you need there, um, but there's also like a, a, a kind of a, like a neglect of the public interest in that area. So yeah, um, so the built environment, you've, you've stayed where you are, which is yeah. great, the stability is, uh, we'll get to affordable housing too, because yeah. I think that's a, a question that comes up there. Um, going on to um, historic preservation, most buildings in Philadelphia are older, and you would probably live in a semi-older house than most Philadelphians. Our historic architecture attracts tourists and tourism revenue and defines our beloved characterful neighborhoods and older existing buildings. And especially row homes, in my opinion, also provide environmentally and economically sustainable housing. What do you see as the value or of our historic buildings? Do you have any thoughts about how to support or protect these quote, natural resources? Uh, given the age of the properties, are there programs you would support to help home homeowners maintain and upgrade existing properties. Yeah, you're probably smarter than I am on this topic, but I would just say, isn't the 10 year tax abatement one of those programs that help people upgrade their homes and, and not pay the, the resulting uh, increase in property value? Anyway, listen, I'm, you know, I understand the problems with 10 year tax abatement, but I think that's what it is supposed to do and could have done and should do. Um, yeah, so for me, I look at it this way, that there are some wonderful, homes, uh, very beautiful. And um, to the extent that they are maintained and, and, and can be improved, that's, uh, that's a real benefit to our city. Um, it's a beautiful look and, and there's a lot to the look of the city, the substance of the city, the history of the city. Homes um, and other buildings actually. Yeah, uh, homes, homes and other yeah. buildings. But like I, churches. I, I really kind of am more, you know, not more, but I'm, I'm equally concerned about like the home serves a purpose, the purpose of the home, the functionality of the home. And I just think there's a lot of uh, homes that were very cheaply built. They're not like some of the other homes. Uh, they were factory box housing. And um, some of the- Older nice, ones or more recent ones uh, or both? The older ones, yeah. Oh. And, and well, I guess we should define older, like, you know, like I'm not talking about the 1600s or the 1800s. Talking more about like the the, the early 1900s, mm. uh, maybe the 1930s and 40s, but um, they have not been uh, kept well. And I think there's a point where, for affordable housing purposes, they're in the the the, the owners of the homes don't have the wherewithal to improve or rehabilitate those homes. And um, my thoughts are really you know around what we can do to help re rehabilitate housing. Uh, but I'm very interested in affordable housing, uh, new, new, new homes being built um, in the neighborhoods that need them. Well, yeah, I'm getting into um, affordability mm -hmm. and, and home ownership. Um, uh, you probably know that the black and brown home ownership in Philadelphia has been on a decline in recent years. Um, what, do, you, do you have any uh, thoughts about if you were mayor, what you would do about that? If, sure. Or is that important? Is that something well, that you... I, I blame the government, to be honest with you. I mean, you may disagree, but as far as I can see, um, the uh, assessment methodology is improper. Um, I think it's illegal, quite frankly. And then the assessments are overly high in the poorest uh, neighborhoods, the low income neighborhoods. And quite frankly, they're in the center part of our, our city, which is mostly African-American, mostly. Uh, also Latino. And so, you know, how is it that these areas that are, you know, the housing, I could look at them, give you a guess of what they should be worth. But if we, if we looked at, uh, for example, 
what kind of uh, loan you could get against one of those houses or how much you could insure it. It's nowhere near the assessed value. The assessed value is just increasing and increasing and it's driving people out of their homes. So I would say that is uh, the, the government driving that. And then when a developer comes in and they get a 10 year tax abatement and they invest money into that home, uh, the city of Philadelphia assesses all the adjoining properties as a much higher rate. Although this is artificially increased by an investment because of a 10 year tax abatement. So while these people are paying, you know, the, 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 the original assessed value of the, the home, which is of greater value, everybody else property values have gone up and um, it is very difficult for them, if not impossible for them to pay that difference. So I, I think that a lot of this um, then just leads to a cycle of, of home ownership becoming problematic and it does affect affordable rentals as well. Um, and I think there's a combination of things that have really led. So for me as mayor, what I've said, I, I would do this. I would freeze OPA. I mm. would just halt that process. Uh, then I would want to look at how we're going to do a better process, a more fair and accurate process. I'd like to see some information in those assessment sheets as opposed to like no information at all. I like to use drones. I'd like to see and, and reconnoiter the area, get at least some sense. And then there are things that are not included in the assess, uh, assessment of the values of these properties, such as crime. You know, the, the crime makes a big difference in what neighborhood, you, the houses may look exactly alike, but one neighborhood is a safe neighborhood. Let's say it's within the Penn catchment area. You got Penn Alexander, you got programs, you got assistance, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. And over here, the houses are exactly the same, but you got murder, you got uh, violent crime, people don't come out. They cannot be assessed equally. Just a quick question. Um, and, uh, it wasn't one of my original questions, yeah. but you, you mentioned before that you were in favor of the tax abatement. And then you just said that the tax abatements are negative for other people that live by, are you for or against tax abatement? Uh, so, or the program as it stands today, it's it's the declining scale. It used to be 10 years across the board for 10 years, 100%. Um, well, how do you feel about that? Well, I think, I think originally the 10 year tax abatement was a good thing. And I think it could be a good thing. I think I think it has by this time uh, fallen into ill repute with the community, and now it becomes problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that's uh, you know for me it's challenging because I think there has to be some modification to the ten-year tax abatement program um, if we're going to keep it. Um, I think there there are people who want to develop, and that's good. On the other hand, um, you know, for me. As far as I understand it, when you get a 10 year tax abatement on this property, and let's say you put $500,000 into it, and now the total value of the property assessed value is a million dollars, how does it affect the property next to it or across the street from it? Like now everybody's property values are increased based on that assessment. And I believe that is incorrect because it wasn't for the 10 year tax abatement, there would have been the, it's not naturally occurring. So I think those are the kind of things that I would look at because if someone wants a building, a, a structure, a home, and you invest in it, that's fine. But if, if you're going to start off a chain reaction of people being pushed out of the entire neighborhood, I think that as for a public policy reason is not what we're trying to do. And I would fight against that. Okay, that's something we should definitely look at. Um, so going to planning, uh, the planning commission in particular, under Mayor Nutter and Alan Greenberger, the, P the planning commission produced a visionary master plan for our, the whole city, but today city planning is gravely understaffed, at least in our opinion. Um, and we lack a clear vision for our future city, even as development seems to be happening on its own without a larger vision. An example of the tail wagging the dog is Market East where huge arena is proposed. How would you support city planning? Or do you think that it needs more support? Do you see a proactive role with more resources or more just um, responding to projects? Um, and what would you look for from a new director of city planning and development? Would you, what kind of person are you looking for? What role? I've looked at other cities. I've looked at uh, Incheon, for example, where they uh, put up a state-of-the-art section of the city, reclaim sea land, 77,000 inhabitants, 365,000 workers. Uh, it's where the UN put their green fund, right? In other words, I was physically there too. I mean, you can visit any place in the world on the internet. 
it's fascinating, but I was physically there. I was there before they actually put one single human being in there. And, you know, you walk into a room, it's all climate control. Everything's like automated and, you know, adjustable. This is before it was like common here in the U.S. It was like unheard of. And, um, and I just, you know, just seeing like their design and how carefully they, like even how they planted the, 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 the vegetation, the plants and, you know, the forest surfaces and the, the water, the amount of water, the golf course, everything was so well designed. They had like a 10 year competition. So when I think about urban uh, planning or urban design or city planning, um, you know, I think there's a lot you could do. I mean, uh, think about the, uh, they put a canal in Seoul. And it's such a fantastic place now. People were kind of like against it when they originally put the design that cost, but you know, people sit there, you know, there's no crime. So you have kids, you have adults, everyone's out all times of hours. It's, it's really a, a, a great thing. So, so I do- That was done through a master plan. Probably, master plan, right? right? In, in other words, I've seen better planning and I just think Philadelphia lacks you know, in, in like the, the commitment to like actually intelligent, we have such fantastic people. We have some of the best people and where's their role in our city? How do we engage them? Cause I think they really want to be engaged. How do we engage them in designing and, and envisioning a city? And then what is the role of the city government? Like for example, uh, I had a meeting with the building trades, um, you know, last year, and we had agreed to three meetings with 22 different countries of investors around building state-of-the-art buildings. It would be overseas money, our workforce, and then our people being employed. So we do need the money, and but then, you know, are they going to design this building all by themselves? Are, are we not going to design it? Where do we place it? You know, what is this the new skyline of Philadelphia? How does that? How do we deal with public transportation, which is another? you know, problem here in the city, like the redesign of public transportation to fit in with the, so yeah, some smart person or persons probably have a good understanding of like, what is the best design for us? Like what fits with Philadelphia historically and geographically? Uh, how do we sit within like the Heinz wildlife thing, our airport, you know, our port or, you know, like, so I do think that one of the places we are sorely in need of expertise, uh, quite frankly, more resources and more authority is in, um, you know, planning our city and its growth. So that's a yes, that's more, a big yes. more resources, yeah. more power, more resources, okay. more power, more, more smart people. Well, I think we have a lot of smart people, <laughs> hopefully. Um, yeah. So uh, we're also especially interested to hear about your thinking about, as we were talking about large projects, uh, Market East and the proposed arena um, and the opportunities and challenges are also redeveloping the roundhouse site, which just is vacant now, and um, also the Bellwether site, which is the huge um, Poco site down in um, Southwest, uh, like South Philadelphia, basically the refineries. Right. Um, what, what's, what's your thought about these very large projects and, and um, how they should be managed, or is there what's what would the role be for the mayor in that? Actually, well, the mayor is the executive of this city. And the, the mayor has a uh, lot of employees and a lot of departments and an ability to work in public-private partnerships. And um, there are a lot of things the mayor can do. And then the mayor works in conjunction. So let's, let's start with the arena. What, where, where are you on that? That would be well, a good start. The, the arena does not seem to fit in that neighborhood, um, in that area. It just doesn't seem like you would put an arena there. So what I would like to see is a, a design. I would like to see something on paper. And if there was something on paper, you could then understand how much it costs, how long it's gonna take, how many people are there, what kind of infrastructure it has. And then you could check and see their parking studies, traffic studies. And then you'd look at how that affects like Jefferson University, how it affects Chinatown, how it affects you know the other neighborhoods. But- We've seen the initial designs. I, I, I mean, there, is, there are some initial- I've never, I've never seen anything worth, are you, are you, are you what, what exactly are you talking about? Um, yeah, the, the perspective. The plan. Okay, have you seen yeah. those? Because yeah, it's I, not it's not detailed, but it's it is uh, it tells you what it's gonna like, how many people are gonna live there, how, how big it's the arena is gonna be, square footage, those kind so, of. So I think just the footprint kind of. Yeah, stuff. I think I've seen that the footprint. Mm -hmm. But that and it's seems, changing a little bit yeah, over time. But yeah, 
it seems to change, right? Mm. I think there's housing now involved in that. Mm. So if it is that changeable, like if, if it adjusts, if it's if that flexible, I, I don't know what it is, you know? Okay. Um, so yeah, I'd like to see, I'd like to see actual commitment that you would get investors around to say, this is what we're putting our money into. Um, and that way the city can say, okay, we know exactly what this is. Does it work or does it not? I think mm -hmm. that's the big issue for me. Um, and, and if we put an arena there, what are we foregoing? You know, you know, and it's mm -hmm. going to impact the area, no doubt. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, I do, I do think that, um, it is up to the Sixers to carry the burden of proving that that thing works where it is. Sure. Um, and we do have another area, the stadium area currently that also has plans of growth and expansion. So mm -hmm. how do those things work? Um, you know, when it comes to concerts, I mean, what concerts? Uh, they would have to have a partner, right? Live Nation is down at the, uh, at the, uh, the, the stadium area. Mm -hmm. Are they gonna, like, who is their partner? And for the games and for the concerts, those are only a certain number of days and nights. It, even if you put retail inside of the, the stadium, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't seem to fit within what is there currently, right? That is kind of a walking area, smaller venues, stores, restaurants. So we do have um, down the street, we do have uh, the, um, the Constitution Center, we have the uh, Independence uh, Hall, we have the Liberty Bell, all those type of things. But we also have federal buildings and things like that. Um, I think about so, federal buildings as mm -hmm. non-taxpaying places. Um, and what I want to, want to know is, are they supposed to be there? Or, or do we move them? Like, are they available? Like, what, what exactly, you know, that's prime real estate. It's in a key area, right. uh, you know. So a, as we're looking at this area, you know, I, I've actually talked to, um, I, I went to visit the chairman of uh, Lotte. Lotte is a very large company that does mega buildings around the world, a very deep subterranean. And they also do indoor, um, indoor um, amusement parks. And I was really talking to them about the development potential in that area for something for children, uh, parents and children's tourists, something you could stay in and put your kids in. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, the, the thing about the arena kind of came out of nowhere, just kind of popped up. And I don't know that it's part of any actual, like thoughtful design. Mm -hmm. um, in, in a larger sense, um, getting back to the mm -hmm. other pro projects that are yeah. going, um, the, the Bellwether district is, is the, probably going to be the largest project uh, square footage wise uh, um, development in the city in years. Uh, I don't know whether you've thought about what role the mayor or the city would have in that as well, because we're talking about some pretty large uh, yeah. projects. Well, when I was a council person, I got a tour of the area and I got explanation of what they're doing and and um you know it's it sounded very good sounded very detailed a lot of a lot of um you know uh kind of uh the what is i guess word? i'm just getting to the point which is what is the like does the mayor through the planning commission sort of help to shape what happens or do they come to the city and say that it looks good or back to the drawing board, how, you know, or is there any power at all, really? If if there is no plan for that area from the city, do they they need to come up with the plan? Is that where where well, what's the balance there? So I, I think what happens is they have the property, mm -hmm. they have a vision, they have an idea, they gather their partners, they put they put the best ideas of what they can do, but they have to have city approval. And, and, and that um, uh, comes down to what the mayor is going to agree to. And, and um, I would not try to proactively take a look at what that area should be. Um, I you know would that not, I would not proactively do that. I, I think, you know, as far as the residents are concerned, the neighborhood people, they have their own ideas. Uh, there is what the, um, what the, what the uh, developers want to do with it, the universities, things like that. And, and when they have come to a certain point, they come before the city and the city looks at everything. And then we kind of, you know, sit in judgment 
hmm. of what are we going to do? What are we going to put behind it? And how does it impact, you know, the city? So, so they will have to come up with those things first. Okay. Um, getting on to more design questions, design review actually is an area that um, we've talked about a lot at DAG. Um, the filled up, that Philadelphia has a powerful design review mechanism for filled up public buildings and buildings with public spaces, facing public spaces since 1911. The Art Commission actually has guided the design of a lot of our great civic environments from the Parkway to Dilworth Park. To bring similar attention to large private projects, the, the new zoning code, which I was a part of the compromise to try to figure out where that voice is um, and, and how much of a, a role um, the public has to play in private pro projects. Um, the, it was designed, uh, the civic design review was created, CDR, um, but it, its recommendations are non-binding, sometimes ignored. Um, and some people believe that it's, it, it results in some pretty cheap looking cookie cutter buildings of the kind that Inga Safran calls, uh, quote unquote, fast casual. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how, how developers can be compelled to improve their designs? I don't. Um, I was a at-large council person. I don't really deal with zoning. That was district council stuff. Um, I think it's very important, but quite frankly, you know, it's not something that crossed my mind. I think what would happen is, first of all, I'd have to win the election. If I were to win the election, I would then have to take a look and see how I would exactly, you know, kind of deal with this. Um, and um, this is an area where I'd be very open to, you know, getting advice. So you're, you're, learning you more would about, come back here and talk yeah, to folks here you, about you could, how we can could, improve that, right? You could <laughs> educate me on that whole thing. Like, uh, I'm not really well versed in, in that type of thing. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, the honesty is good. Um, um, so one of the areas I'm very interested in is affordable housing. So yeah. I have a few questions here and um, we'll have a few minutes to get into this. Uh, for context, the current definition that we use for affordable, affordable this always comes up in conversations we have all the time. Uh, we call it uh, area median income is, is defined by, um, actually by HUD and uh, we're using the area which in Philadelphia, in the Philadelphia region, the Office of Housing uses uh, the current number is $80,100 for a single person. Um, many people feel that's too high. And some programs are actually set at 120%, which means that the, the single person's income could go up to as high as $96,100 to be eligible for uh, the uh, the program that is at 120% uh, max. Um, understanding the different needs, for example, home ownership versus renters, as well as limited resources to subsidize affordability is important rather than pie in the sky, sometimes given the cost of new construction. How would you support, how would you support affordable housing? Do you have any thoughts about what levels we should be thinking about for affordability as well? Well, <clears throat> I did a, a bill uh, to uh, add $50 million a year annually to the housing trust fund, which at the time was uh, receiving 14 to 17 million a year. So that would have brought it to 64 and 67, that. right? That was soundly defeated, um, which I found like interesting because the language of we need more money for affordable housing, the housing trust fund, but then when you put a bill and it gets defeated, Okay, but then nobody else introduced a bill until like three, four years later when Derek Green introduced a bill for about 25, 26 million. So there, there, it's about half the amount of money. And that does pass, but um, I think, um, you know, a city of our size with our problems, the, 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 the amount of money in the, um, you know, in the housing trust fund should be about $100 million. I think that is like a, a reasonable level of money. Secondly, I think there has to be some modifications to that. And me personally, um, you know, I, I believe that um, the affordable housing should be, you know, whether it's rental units or, or homes or whatever, uh, should primarily be built in the neighborhoods where, where the housing needs to be replaced and where people actually live and need affordable housing. Um, so I do have this, you know, kind of a different point of view. 
Um, I think a lot of the the the, the money that go for affordable housing. Can I just ask you that? Yeah. What you were saying that affordable housing should go in neighborhoods where not not spread around, but in specific areas, or no. I, in other words, yeah. I think affordable housing should be built in poor neighborhoods. In poor neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods. low income neighborhoods. Okay. What about um, more affluent neighborhoods? Well, I, how many units can you possibly build in affluent neighborhoods? That's my question. Like, uh, it is expensive to build. It, it's it's a high cost, and um, there's not too many units. And uh, I, I I will disagree with the idea that poor people want to live with rich people. And and that kind of seems to be an idea that I that I sometimes uh, run across. Um, like, I think. Uh, when, when there is uh, affordable ho housing dollars going into gentrifying areas, you're not going to build enough units. You're not going to build enough housing. It is uh, very expensive. And uh, you're not using typically neighborhood skilled labor either, because that's really kind of controlled by the unions. But if we would build them in neighborhoods like Cobbs Creek or King Sessing or areas like that, um, I would uh, like to see that we could build more units and that we could use neighborhood skilled labor in, in, in the construction process. Okay. Um, also, our zoning and other require, requirements make it really hard to build more densely, which would lower the cost of acquisition, provide economies of scale, and provide more units. As an example of how small thinking, in my opinion, um, and councilman prerogative can decrease affordability, we saw a Habitat for Humanity project in North Philadelphia delayed for about a year and then scaled back to allow for continued off-street parking by neighbors on vacant lots. Um, do you support councilman a prerogative that can stop affordable housing projects, projects to be maximized? Uh, do I support councilmanic prerogative? You know, um, I would explain it this way. Um, there is councilmanic prerogative. It's not a rule, it's not a law, anything. It's just a natural fact that you have 10 districts and you have seven at large. And so anytime someone steps on a district, the other nine council members will support, you know, the, the, the district council person, even if all seven at larges were to oppose it. So it's not like it's a rule or a law. It's just uh, what happens when you have 10 council, uh, council districts and council members who are going to protect their authority to the extent they have it in their district. Uh, what I do look at is that if you were to somehow remove that, and then the mayor would be in charge of everything, uh, people would not be able to, to, to oppose the mayor uh, because you would not have a way to do that. Um, I do think that uh, people in a district, they get a chance to elect their district council person, whether, whether they voted for or against that person, that person is there. And that person is able to look at one tenth the city, um, and uh, if they if they are um, not doing what people want, people have a chance to vote them out. They may not vote them out, but if if you don't have a way to fight, you know the city. If you don't like what they're doing, uh, the only way you would be able to do that is through your council member. So your answer is. You're you're okay with councilmanic prerogative because I, I think, it supports I, what people want. Well, I think it's a reality. I, I, you know, I, I, I think when people pose the question, do you support or not support, as in what? Like it is there. You know, it's a, it's a reality of having 10 over seven and, and, and the fact that 10 of those members have districts. Mm -hmm. So they're going to support each other uh, in terms of, so if someone could give me an example uh, of, of how, you know, in other words, when someone doesn't like that the, the, the council person is opposing some plan of the city, they say, well, well that's terrible. But, but when they don't like the plan of the city, they go to their district council person and say, go fight for us. So which one is it going to be? This is the system currently. And I think it's just like you can't there's winners and losers in this. If you if you didn't like your council member, right? And but they does won, the mayor play a role in, in leadership in this? I mean, is there a time when? Yeah, yeah, when, the mayor does. Like sure. you know, we're thinking small on the on the ground level, but we should well, be thinking that, larger. Yeah, that. So yeah, the mayor can fight councilmanic uh, mm -hmm. prerogative. Um, what happens is, 
the legislation um, based on councilmatic prerogative, the council member, let's say is fighting against the mayor, doesn't want it. And the other um, council members, the other nine support that member. So they have enough to pass legislation. But to override a, a veto, you need 12. So now, instead of all 10 supporting something, you, 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 you need to find two other at-large members. That, that's where the mayor can get involved in fighting councilmatic prerogative. The other thing is the mayor can just kind of ignore it. Um, there's many things which don't really need legislation. And quite frankly, you know, mayors uh, oftentimes disregard the legislation of council. Um, and so, yeah, it depends on the will of the mayor. In other words, if I wanted, to, if, if there was something I was doing and a council member wanted to block it and I just felt like I wanted to do it, I would go ahead and do it. It would be very hard for that council member to oppose me because we're a strong mayor city. And um, the mayor's got the muscle to almost do anything. I'll just say the, the recent, wants. yeah, the recent example is yeah. the uh, safe injection site. Uh, you know, well, you know what discussion, happened? which sure. is kind of interesting. So, so let's say the mayor, the mayor wanted it, but he he got overridden basically. Well, he's not really overridden. I think the whole thing is kind of fake to begin with, because of this. The safe injection site is illegal under the law. Uh, there was only a temporary time where a district judge in Philadelphia said that that it could be placed, right? But then it was overridden in an appellate court, and that that's okay. the end of yeah, that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of using right. that just as so, an so example. So here's right. my point, really. So you can't put a, a heroin injection site into a neighborhood. Can't mm -hmm. do it. It's illegal. Mm -hmm. It's a violation of federal and the state law. So city council says it's also a violation of our ordinance. Okay. Your ordinance is not a commonwealth law. It's not federal law. It's an ordinance. It, it really is kind of like not important. You can't do it when the mayor does it. It's a violation of the state criminal law and the federal criminal law. So, which is a, which is a different issue, I think, actually, yeah, than, so, than the issue of whether city council can sort of override the mayor's. Well, in other words, let's say the mayor wants where to put the a balance of power is. So, and, and, when the mayor wants to put a heroin injection site over here. Right. And now you have the federal law, the state law, and the city ordinance that says you can't, and he just does it anyway, because the police work for the mayor, because the district attorney is in agreement, because mm -hmm. the U.S. attorney, is, uh, let's say, makes an agreement, the attorney general is not going to back it up, so I just stick it there. Right. Now, what is this ordinance going to do? Right. No, I'm just saying as an example of mayor's power versus, if you were a mayor and yeah. you wanted to get something done. But, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah. not I, I, I should nice, probably not have used yeah. the safe in Texas. So, example, well, my but. point is, if the mayor can bulldog even an illegal entity into a neighborhood, that would be majorly problematic because you, you have, as a community, no way to fight that. There's no zoning issue. Let's say you went to this ordinance, you can't do it in my district, you couldn't do it anyway. And if the mayor wants to do it, what is the ramifications of him? violating the council ordinance does it stop the process it doesn't understood yeah I, I just think that the mayor sometimes should have the bigger picture in mind versus the the council people who have definitely their, their district in mind well to um, answer your question it's kind of to me more like this um when we were talking about the prisons up on state road or when we talk about the airport uh, i disregard councilmatic privilege you know or prerogative because that's a citywide issue so me, as a at-large council person, I'm really not concerned what the district council person thinks. That's just one person in a little piece of Philadelphia. The whole rest of the city and the region is going to be impacted by the airport or by the stadium or by the prisons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there, I, I'm fully involved as an at-large council person. If I were mayor, I would certainly not see this district council person as having any kind of authority above me on citywide assets. Okay, got it. Um, so an, another question on affordable housing yep. or related to housing. Uh, we have a shortage across the country right now. Places like Seattle and San Francisco are in really terrible shape. Um, there's also a shortage in Philly. Uh, about two years ago, LISC estimated 70,000 affordable rental units shortage. Um, one way it's being addressed in a growing number of places, including the whole state of California and even Montana, you may know this or you may not, is to make accessory dwelling units allowed in more residential zone, residentially zoned areas. 
Um, this allows elders to age in place. I experienced this when I was growing up. I lived above my grandmother. Um, currently, because of the tight restrictions on ADUs in Philly, we actually have zero recognized ADUs in, in our city. Um, and it's growing across the country, but we still have zero in Philadelphia because it's almost impossible to put one into the city given the various regulations that, um, especially zoning. Uh, would you support broad zoning changes to allow for um, accessory dwelling units to be built as a matter of right instead of having to apply for variance? Oh, I don't know. I would have to look at that. I mean, it, let me ask you, is that kind of like best, best practices commonly uh, everybody agrees that should be done? Or is that controversial? Like what are the unintended consequences? Yeah, it's um, it's it's a big question. I'll, I'll just tell you, in California, they they are they're building them now because they have such a shortage that the the majority of um, new units being built, uh, being renovated or built, are ADUs right now. So, so if we were to let of, people do that by right, they just start doing correct. that. How does that impact the city? Do you think? Well, that's that's the question, right? We allow certain things to happen as a matter of right. If if you don't. The question is, if you don't, as we do, don't now, you get zero. Um, so there's the question of, do you, where's the bat, what, where would you be on that spectrum? Because we have zero now, we have a big um, need for affordable housing and ADUs is, is one of the, one way to do it, which is they call gentle density because it's really only like shoehorning into what's already existing versus building like, oh, well, we could build a tower here and put in 50 more units, but this is this is a way to, to use existing infrastructure. So I'm, I, I'm, you may not have an answer now, but I'm, I'm just wondering what your no. thoughts no. are on, on the need to do something about affordability before it becomes a, a crisis, actually. Well, I mean, from, from my perspective, um, I, I see a, I see a major issue about people being pushed out of their homes. Um, and then they don't have a place to be. So now their homes are uh, turned into uh, more expensive homes. So where, where are those, they, they need affordable housing now. I'd like them to stay in their homes. Uh, when it comes to like, um, by right, uh, you know, I would have to look at that, um, well, you know what happens when it's not by right? It's councilmanic prerogative. So there we go. We go back to square one, right? Yeah, <laughs> but see, the thing for me is this: you do whether you 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 vote or you don't vote, you have the opportunity to impact who that person is, and and uh, people should like be engaged with knowing who's running for office, and certainly finding out from them, you know, what their positions are. Because mm -hmm. that's really, yeah, the council, the council person, um, and there may be some other things that could be done about transparency and, and those type of things. Um, but I, but I do think people, you know, people do have an opportunity to have a say in something. So yeah, I hear what you're saying, but um, it's interesting. Um, so if 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 we're talking about a specific issue and you disagree with your council person, let's say, uh, because you couldn't get your ADU or whatever, um, you have the right to vote against that person. But what you're saying though is, is that's gonna make the difference, but I don't think it always does because those, there are very many micro issues like that. And um, count, you know, council people usually get reelected once they're in. So, um, I guess the question is, is sort of where's the, where's the power balance and, and where, when can you do things by matter of right versus everything going through um, as, as an at-large, you don't have any say in that either, um, but. Uh, yeah, you know, so just, just based on principle, I do think that um, like having having an ability to impact things through your vote is very important. Mm -hmm. um, if you end up, you know, not being happy about who you elected or who somebody else elected, um, that's what happens in elections. Like me personally, 
you know, I know people, for example, very unhappy about certain elected officials. Um, they were elected. There's many who I don't agree with at all, but I don't disrespect the fact that they were elected. I cannot pretend they don't exist. Like, for example, I'm not actually for the impe impeachment of Larry Krasner. I do agree, disagree quite a bit with uh, Mr. Krasner. However, I respect that he's properly elected. He told everybody what's he going to do. He's doing what he's doing. Why would we impeach him? Um, you know, I know there's different uh, attitudes and ideas, but as, as far as I'm concerned, if someone gets elected and uh, it's not someone that I, I like or agree with, but that's the election, I live with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, maybe I'll just ask one more question then we can open it up. Is that, does that sound good? All right, um, so Philadelphia schools, uh, there, there are a number of more questions, but um, I think schools are super important. Um, need many things, including repaired, restored, or, re or new facilities. We've got asbestos in some places. Um, but to address the inequalities among Pennsylvania school districts, the Supreme Court has recently declared that Philadelphia will receive, will receive a larger portion of the funding pie. In Philly, we have some schools that have so many issues, some too few students, some overcrowded. We have some that have to close on hot days uh, due to lack of air conditioning. Um, there are various proposals, but there are some now to bring uh, solar panels and other sustainable energy to, to schools, use heat pumps to cool classrooms. Um, what it, and, and just either just um, fix the schools or tear them down and start all over again. I mean, there's a whole range gamut of, of proposals. What is the role of... Um, of the mayor in this, and and what what do you think? Um, how would you allocate more funds, or what what would your priorities be in terms of funding the schools? Because because it's not all the mayor, of course, and it's not all city council; it's the school district as well. Yeah, the mayor has a very huge uh, impact on the school, uh, and I'd start with this. First of all, the mayor is going to appoint nine school board members, so you know you get a whole new school board. Uh, me personally, since I have tried to do this legislatively, what I will do as mayor, if I am mayor, I will find nine. I will tell four that you're going to be involved in the overall aspects of the school, you know, look at the whole district, and I'll take five and say you each get one-fifth of the city. If you agree to be on the school district as my appointee, I'd like you to focus on one area of the city, uh, have some affinity to it, visit every school there, understand what's going on, have meetings out there. Like I want you to go into each one of these areas so people know who you are. Mm -hmm. They talk with you, they hear you. I want you to understand what's happening. Then I want you to tell the rest of the members and that'll be nine. Uh, what I would say is this, me, me personally, I want transparency because I don't really, you know, I've been on council for 11 years. I don't really know what goes on in the school district because we get a very superficial financial report and there's a lot of opaqueness to it. And I think that is a huge problem. If I'm a councilman, and by the way, I'm an attorney and I cannot get a straight answer out of the school, mm -hmm. uh, how, how can regular folks do that? So what I would require of these nine members is we have some transparency so we can understand the money that comes in, where does it go, what salaries, what's this, what's that. Then per school, yeah. I want to know how much of every dollar is going into the classroom, what are the expenses, what's going where, and it's just out in the open. Quite frankly, if you wanted to see my salary as a council person and anyone in my office, it's public knowledge. You can go find it. So I don't have any problems with transparency. I think the lack of transparency is a big problem. So once I have an idea of what the total costs are and how it breaks down, I could look at equity. And I want to look at equity. I want to know how come these schools are well-maintained and these ones are dilapidating and these are problematic. And then I also want to know about like, why do we do these things? So I want to know the cost of bringing everything up to speed. And yeah, I want to decide on which buildings are going to be demolished, which ones are going to be built new. Um, I really suspect asbestos. I've never liked the whole asbestos thing. I don't understand why we uh, kind of like have coded it when we know it's going to be a problem, why, why don't we remediate it? Why don't we remove it and, and do that once and for all? So I want to know the cost of it. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some horrendous stuff in our schools. 
um, which seems to be more like about paying people to do stuff in our schools than is about fixing the facilities. I'm just saying that plainly. So to me, I'd like to know where this money is, what is going on, but I'm interested in education. I want to see, you know, the, what the kids are learning. I want to see that we have a, a level of, uh, of equal opportunity in our schools when it comes to curriculum, and I want to comply with state law. So in that, um, let's say as mayor, I'm going to zero based budgeting. You cannot do it in the first year, but in the second year. So um, I find a lot of problems with our budget and I find a lot of problems with the fact that we don't actually know what money is spent, how much is wasted. Um, if I could give an example, cause I know I'm speaking a little vaguely. Um, my example is um, the pothole. There's a pothole and it costs a hundred dollars to fill and it'll last for five years. But in the world of politics, there is a pothole and someone gets a chance to fill it. And if it only lasts a year, you get $500 instead of $100, right? So you're making $500 instead of $100 in a pothole that only lasts for a year. Now, if, if I keep getting reelected and you keep helping me, that one pothole could be three potholes. Now you got $1,500. And after a period of time, why even bother filling it? Why don't you just give me the bill and I'll give you the taxpayer money because that's really the point of the pothole. The problem is that when a new person gets elected within the network and system of politics, they don't clear away that $1,500. They just make it $1,600. You're going to keep paying the $1,600, the, the $1,500, add $100 to fill the pothole, right? So if you look at it that way, how much, how expensive is everything in our city? And, and it's very wasteful and it's there intentionally and it can only be stripped down if you make it transparent and you identify all those things and then you've got to step on toes. And I, th I think in politics and in government, in government that has been entrenched around politics, that is the problem. People, they do not want to step on toes and they do not want to clear those things away. And so for me, I don't actually know like what is, what is the real cost of education how much of it is just being put into, you know, paying off different folks who supported different people in their elections. It's a reward. And our school buildings historically have been a place of reward. Like we've had a corrupt school system since the colonial days and we have different various types of reforms. So I really would like to look at that and make sure that we're doing the best we can for our kids. But I want to comply with the law. And I think that that is for me, like the baseline on almost everything. There, there are laws that require equity, equal opportunity. There are laws that are just violated in the city, you know, consistently and constantly. So I guess two things, um, just to come full circle on yeah. this. Um, we had talked about uh, historic buildings. A lot of uh, the, the schools are historic in nature. Um, there's some really beautiful schools out there, but are they equipped to handle the 21st century uh, education and are is it is it does it make sense to um, redo them um, and keep that or sell them off or knock them down? What um, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of range of ways to deal with it. But I think those who who appreciate the the um, the architecture of a lot of the schools would would prefer not to have them be uh, demolished and and rebuilt as modern schools but the you know there's there's a question of how how to deal with that yeah so i i think that's you know i understand there's some beautiful school buildings i really do we have some beautiful stuff um but the the purpose to me of a school building is to educate children it has to be functional what do we do with the beautiful school building well someone's got to figure out what to do with it I, I, i'm all fine with like if someone wants to turn it into something that's fine with me, but but many of the school buildings are very difficult to deal with. The finances are not there. You know, you wouldn't have, um, let's say, uh, the revenues. Um, so, what exactly do you do with them? That's really, I don't, I I really would not be investing a lot of city money to just make a monument to the past, unless there was a group of citizens that really wanted to support that whole effort, a corporation or somebody like the money we have will go to educating our students. And for me, we're bringing back vocational career training into every school. 
And I'm a big proponent of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, VET programs as in Europe. So Germany, Switzerland, and Aust Austria, I will have those programs and I will go to Harrisburg and get the, the enabling legislation if I'm there to put those programs into our city. Yes. So my, my question is, Oh, um, we need our microphone. We're recording this. So. Yeah, what, what so is we're going to go to questions now. Yeah. So. What, what is the reason that I think they took out vocational career programs to begin with? Well, I think there were two things that happened. I think that at that time, uh, there was a push that everyone should go to college. Um, at the same time, I think there was a group of people that we're happy to see that we didn't provide vocational training and career training to, to, to in our high schools anymore because that reduces the competition. And, and, and I think those two things, I think it is a, I think it was a huge mistake because when you look at, for example, Switzerland, uh, you know, 30% of kids graduating go to college, 70% do not. And, and, and there's no discrimination against those who didn't go to college versus mm. who, who did. In Switzerland, there, there's, uh, you know, they have a, VT, a VET program certification and, and other things. And, and, I, and I think, you know, part of it is the, the idea that everyone must go to college. I mean, it is uh, against the idea that everyone is very different and they have different aspirations, different talents. Andy is a guitar player. I have a guitar. I can't play it. but I just like having it. Uh, the, the thing is, like, you know, like I enjoy the guitar. I'm not a good guitar player. I don't have time for it. And even if I did, it probably wouldn't be any good anyway. It doesn't mean I don't enjoy the guitar. But I recognize that Andy's got some more musical ability than I do. And, and so some kids are fantastic with their hands. Some are very good with writing music. Some people are great at construction. You know, th th my brother was in construction. He was a handyman. Now he's got a big company is far more wealthy than I am. Lives in a beautiful house. My wife envies every time we go there. But my point is everyone's got a different path to go. I thought the point of education was, was to, to, to empower uh, young people to, to have the tools and the ability to, to discover who they are, what their, what their, what their mm -hmm. journey is, and then you know, to make their own decisions. You know? so, so whatever road they go on, kind of that is the process of education, right? So, so why would you take out vocational career training? My father, as a pastor, we were always sawing and cutting and nailing and do put up drywall and plumbing. You know, I'm not a professional, you know, plumber or whatever, and I, I don't do it. But, but I did know it. I do understand it. I do appreciate what it is. But some people, they're just they're gifted with a hammer and a saw or whatever they do. You know, I mean, I got to measure three times and it's still wrong. Mm -hmm. Other people, they eyeball it and psh, there it is. I mean, everyone's got different talents. I just uh, never really kind of understood what is the purpose of trying to put people into a certain box. Mm -hmm. We have a, oh, one I'm, question. I'm oh, Greetings. Uh, my name is Shawnee Struthers. Yes. And we were featured in the Philadelphia Inquirer front page, September 24th. Mm -hmm. And they gave us three pages because our house has been has been damaged by a developer who mm -hmm. has not been made to follow the laws of and the existing code of Philadelphia yeah. by LNI planning zoning a fire department police department and our life our generational wealth <coughs> which was given to my father for not he earned it by yes. serving in the Army Corps of Engineers in the Philippines and and. Uh, we use a GI bill to purchase that home. Yeah. And now this developer has decided to come and strip us of, of our, not just us, many, 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 many people in Philadelphia yes. and around the world are suffering from the same problem. Yes. As mayor, what would you do to have the city code, the inspectors, <laughs> the laws, the planning department, all of the things that have to do with the built environment. We're here to talk about the built environment, correct? Yeah. Yep. That would have our built environment that would have people want to invest in it. Even business owners, not just homeowners, anyone who owns property would like to own property. <laughs> they would take pause and say, why would I want to invest my life in, in, and my money into a city that can't protect me? Yes. Agreed. Thank you. So when I was on council, I introduced a bill that 
when there is an EOP, Equal Opportunity Plan, uh, and there is a city funded construction project, uh, and there is an agreement from the, the uh, primary contractor that they have a minority or female owned business, uh, typically in our city, um, after they get the contract, they never contact the minority female owned business, happens con constantly. And then they get paid and they bid for another contract to get another contract. So I did a bill that if you do not have the requisite, required, agreed upon, contracted um, you know, participation that we will withhold the payment. No, I don't understand what your question is, but I'm going to get to your question, but I want to you to understand. I am interested in that you said aside all that stuff, but, but more interest, I'm interested Yeah, in so, so for home ownership in terms of what you're talking about, it's the same thing. Um, like all of these things that, that I see in the city is that they don't enforce the rules, the contracts, the laws, or anything like that. I consider that all of that to be a fraud upon the government. So for example, if you have a developer and they have damaged your property and you know, you're, you're supposed to be able to get an LNI inspector. First of all, as mayor, LNI will work after five o'clock. And, and again, I will, I will supplement them with technology. But um, when it comes to the damage that is done, uh, they will be held accountable. Um, Who will be held accountable? LNI should be held accountable for the damage that happens with the transpire? Whoever is there, are you saying it was a private developer or someone on behalf of the city? L and I, and I have hundreds of 311 right. calls and 911 yep. calls. L and I allowed this developer yeah. to destroy my mother's house because of their PTSD. He stopped the house every time. So, I was yeah. It's a crime. So, it's, it's, and yeah. I, 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 went to, I called the office inspector general for corruption. Right. For, uh, for corruption. Right. I called every single office, even at this point. <clears> yeah. Nobody lifted a finger. We were in the newspaper and nobody even called us. And we were on the front page. Okay. And it's election time and nobody even called us. Okay. So, so I, I, uh, I, I, I want to so, know how are we going to. How are we going to reform L and I? Can we put these, put these criminals in jail because of domestic terrorism? Can we put them in jail? Yeah, we can. We can. I, I've reported, I've reported city <laughs> workers to the U.S. Attorney's Office, yes. to the Attorney General's Office, the FBI, yes. particularly you know related to sexual abuse of children, uh, that type of thing. L, L, L and I, and every other city agency, um, you know, they, they have like if if you have evidence that they knowingly allowed someone to come in and create all that damage and. So the, the entity that did the damage is liable to you. L and I, whoever it is, you know, has to be just like we would if there was a police abuse or any other type of abuse. There has to be an internal investigation. And they say you can't sue the city. Well, the city. Well, you you can. Um, the the city has um, municipal liability, you know, immunity on certain things. However, um, any type of uh, violation of of the of the of the standards of of you know what the laws are and things like that, um, that's something that the city can agree to pay. The mayor says, "Okay, we were wrong. We pay it." That's an authorization to the law department. So that's the mayor will do. It's not a lawsuit. The mayor will just have to decide to do that. No, no, you have to bring a lawsuit. You have to bring a complaint. But what I'm saying is, you don't necessarily. Yeah, you you get a lawyer and they will they will. There's limited immunity so so the the city is not immune from everything and when you bring there's so you can sue individuals and um the city does cover the wrong conduct of its employees as an individual employee now what they so, did was they we had an unsafe violation the person that passed the unsafe violation no efforts on our part retired the next day and the person that now has this case, they say, well, I don't know anything. That person be right. So how's that supposed to work? Well, I don't think we're going to be able to yeah. solve this today. Yeah, so, so, so there are so many complaints in this city. What I would say is simply this, that if there is a complaint that you should be able to come to the city, not your council person, you should be able to come to the city department, lay out your complaint, the city can look at it, and, and if they find that you are correct, they have to correct the problem and correct the department that is responsible for the problem. Did you say go to the DA's office? No, coming to the city. 
come to the like if your complaint it was the L and I department, right? One, 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 yes. one of them yes. or other ones. Then you tried to go to the inspector general, right? Yes, I did. Okay, so it's, right. So and, and state, so mm -hmm. so we do have a a office for complaints. Um, at least we used to, right? Um, uh, if there isn't one, there should be one. I would put one in there. There, there's a place for you to have complaints, claims against the city, and then they would investigate your claim to see if you are justified in being reimbursed, and then looking at what happened if there was a a a violation by the city uh, staff or the city worker or whomever. It doesn't matter if they retired or not. Right. But those are things that should be done. So I think. Yeah, that, that is an issue that will have to be resolved, not in this forum, but but definitely um, worth looking into. Um, George had a... Yeah, a, question on another, a question on another scale. Um, we Philadelphia is, is a very, very important city, and we have the, the challenge, shall we say, of being, is that our region is in three, three, three different states, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware, and we really, are the most important uh, urban center between uh, Trenton and uh, Wilmington and between Atlantic City and Lancaster uh, on the other axis. And many of the suburban communities uh, posture that they hate us, uh, but in fact, they don't, in my opinion. But how do we gain, how can we gain a much more cordial and positive relationship to our hinterland? Uh, because I think that is holding us back and it also holds them back. They might not realize it, uh, but I think there's, there's an insularity that some mayors have had where they, the city is so big and very powerful that they don't feel they have to reach out, but there's more at stake here. We are like the capital of, of, of an imaginary city or imaginary state, you might say, that's, in, that's actually in three states. How would you reach out to these, uh, to the hinterlands uh, and, and, the, and the suburbs? Well, I, I would reach out to them. I mean, I did that as a council person. Uh, there's various issues. One of them was quite frankly, the opioid issue. And because we are a city and then we have different counties and New Jersey, our bureaucracies are all very different. And so we were not able to really serve the people um, who, are traveling in and out of Philadelphia, Bucks County, Delaware County, Burke County, you know, Kemp. So, so we could have put together a regional process of insurance, service, and, and, and bed space and really kind of supported, you know, the kind of uh, addicted persons and their families and whatnot in a much better way. Um, I think all of those things, um, it just takes the, the mayor to reach out and say, we'd like to form something because we'd like to put our congressional power together We'd like to have some ability to make our city much broader in terms of what's our mutual interest. Like right now, a lot of people, um, you know, they, they live in, in, in the suburbs, a wonderful place to be. Uh, but you can't, you can't go to the Eagles game or the Philly game out in the suburbs. You come into the city. And there are things in our city that make suburban life um, just much more better. Um, you know, the arts and the culture and all those things. Or for business coming into our city, hotels or whatnot. But we're also the regional seat. And so we have a lot, again, of non-tax paying properties that are to the benefit of everybody that it falls upon only Philadelphia taxpayers, you know, to carry that weight. Um, so for me, you know, I would like to cooperate with them. They enjoy coming in the city. We enjoy going out to the burbs and, you know, we shop there. They come in here. So, so why don't we work, um, you know, better when it comes to economic development? which is critical to all of us here. We present better as a region when we're looking at the global economy and how we put together our packages. When we compete against each other, we're minimizing our opportunities. When we combine them, listen, if someone were to come into the Philadelphia area and end up in Bucks County or Delaware, we're still benefit from that. If they end up in, they're probably coming to Bucks or Delaware because of Philadelphia, because we've got an airport, because we have, so, so we're not separated that way. What they think of is that we are the, 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 the seat of crime and problems that they feel is invading their, their, but nowadays they're coming to our, 
town and carjacking us. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, but the point is we have this kind of relationship, right? We could have a much better relationship. And, and, and I think we, we, as you said, we, we, we live together well. It's just that we posture ourselves as keep out of our, our, our space. Somebody, oh, you had a question and then go back. Uh, my name is Richard Parties. I'm an architect. Um, so the Republicans are a minority political party in Philadelphia. What are the key issues that the Republican Party uh, cares about here in the city? I really don't know, to tell you the truth. I'm not quite involved with the party. Uh, quite frankly, the party typically opposes me, in case you didn't know. <laughs> I'm usually opposed by the party. Um, I am a Republican, and what I would say is, at least from my perspective, you know, I look at it this way. There are people who see the goodness of government, and government does good things. And then there are people who see, you know, the importance of individual rights, and individual rights are very important. Sometimes, you know, government should be leading the way and doing all those good things. And sometimes you really want to have government like stay in its space, because anytime it expands, it's stepping on our individual rights. So for me, I'm happy to support my friends in, in politics when they have a new wonderful role for government to save the day. But I can point out way too many cases where government supposed to save the day is creating lots of problems. And, and so someone has to hold government uh, accountable for the mess it's creating and the fact that it's doing a lot of violating of the law and other things. You know, So almost everything I could point out to in the city that is wrong from schools um, to uh, the tax, taxing of property, um, to, to the lack of uh, uh, the violation of all kinds of laws relating to um, everything from uh, whose children you take to, to, to what schools don't provide the required languages in the school or, or provide for kids with special needs. Um, public transportation, look at that. Um, you know, so, so government can, can uh, be proud of the wonderful things it's supposed to do, but someone also has to say, but you're not doing it. And why don't we do this? Here's a complaint about government, right? Government not doing its job allowing people to come in and ruin your home, not being able to talk to government, government's ears are closed, why is that? So, so if, if everyone was in love with government, uh, the resident, the citizen would have no one to go to. In fact, my role pretty much on council mm -hmm. was when nobody would listen to the, the people complaining and they would come to my door and then I would listen to them and try to do something about it. So in general, I do think, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know about parties. I think parties are based on people. Sometimes the Democratic Party stands for this. Sometimes it stands for that. Sometimes the Republicans are here. Sometimes they're over there. I think basically, you know, the Republican Party is based on the idea of a republic, a constitution, uh, and basically the idea is that all people are created equal, that's in the law. And then the fact is that you need a strong you know, uh, a defense to have your freedoms internally. And there's a limited, there's not small government. It's a limited role of a government to not impinge on the, the rights of the individual. You know, but there, there are very different opinions about that. And even though I said that's what the, I think what the Republican philosophy is, it just depends on who's running the party. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the Democratic Party, um, you know, has certainly been around longer and has changed. And now it's the party of inclusion and the big tent. Um, and, uh, but, but in that process, it's very hard to, to, to treat everyone equally. You know? And that's part of one of the challenges of government right now, that you know, it, it has a bigger and bigger and bigger role. And at a certain point in time, government is the one to tell you what you should do. And that becomes problematic for me. So we, we have a, a couple, couple minutes left. Yeah. So we got two in the back here, and right. then I think we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, so um, the city has a understaffing issue, and you know, city departments are are. I mean, 
full staffing of city departments is what's needed to help support whoever's going to be the next leader of um, Philadelphia. So I don't know how, like, if you have, what ideas are you open to, to uh, trying to make sure that we have enough staff to be able to support uh, the built, like, um, uh, I guess, support the community around, you know, having a, a well-planned um, uh, design uh, or planning in, in the city as well as like uh, staffing that we need to, you know, uh, address public safety in the built environment. Um, so uh, I'd like to hear what, what, your think, what your thoughts are, if, if you think it's a problem too. Well, I think it's a problem. I mean, I might think of it a little differently. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'm not sure who's coming back to work in the city. You know, the city workers, many of them are not working in at their at their place of work. Um, and that, you know, public service is a little different than 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 working in a private company. Um, and, and, and there's people can work at home and their, their measurements are different. But when you're in public service, usually you're responding, you're responding to people's needs. So if you're not where you're supposed to be because you're not accessible at home, that becomes a problem. So in my campaigns, I've run into city workers and they've asked me, are you gonna make me come back to the, to, to, to the office? And my answer is, yeah, you gotta come back. Everybody's gotta come back, pandemic's over. Um, but there's also a lack of technology in our city, which would be very helpful in making sure that things were done. And for me, uh, I would like to have technology because by having technology, um, we can reduce the, the amount of uh, kind of um, human hours doing things that quite frankly don't get to a lot of times uh, because it's kind of rote. It's just like in doing the same thing again and again. But there's been a great resistance to putting like a technology into city government. Um, and I remember I was very excited about a big budget, you know, big, big allocations of hundreds of millions of dollars. And, um, and they said, like, you're going to be able to do all your stuff online at, at night with the city hall and you could do all these things instead of coming in. Never happened. You know, this is years ago, but it was like three hundred twenty million dollars. Where did it all go? Anyway, you know, I, I would like to put the technology in. And, 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 and so people come to work and we have, we have a number of people who aren't coming back. And, um, uh, you know, when you look at certain, like, for example, social workers, uh, school teachers and police officers, they're just leaving our city and uh, police officers are demoralized. They're very unhappy and they don't want to work for our city. Teachers and social workers, uh, they are complaining about the, the violence. They're complaining about crime. They don't want to work in the city. And I just met a social, uh, social worker the other day. She says, when I go out to do my visits, I need protection. Like I, I'm showing up at places and I feel very much exposed. And the city wants me to drive out to these houses and go there. And, you know, I'm subject to all kinds of like fear and problems. Like, why is the city not protecting me? We have a lot of complaints, you know, from people. So I do think this is an opportune time to really kind of uh, redo our, our, our system of government and to ensure that people are able to use the technology that they have in their pocket to, to contact us. We have records, things like that, to use their video, to use their cameras and to help us that way. And I think the idea that people, you know, the idea that people have like these kind of set jobs and that um, if you don't have technology, you don't have accountability uh, is very problematic for me. So. Uh, I see many ways where you will enhance what people do because you're spending more human time, more thoughtful time, and less kind of like busy time if you'll put more technology in. So we have time for one more. So oh, imagine yourself as... Well, you guys want to share the, oh, two more. No two more? <laughs> oh, uh, we have time for two more? Go ahead. Sure, go <laughs> okay. Um, so we've talked about a lot of what makes Philadelphia great and a lot of problems uh, and inefficiencies in our city. For example, like I don't understand, you know, why we have like a wage tax versus like property tax. Um, I don't understand why it's so hard to start business or uh, I don't understand why it's so hard to build, whether that's through prerogative or things like that. But at the same time, I'm also not sure if 
um, small fixes or like um, like adjustments are really what can save the city once you know the bailout money runs out there's a lot of fundamentals wrong with the you know downtown businesses and vacancies so you know I think at a fundamental level if you have like looking if you're facing um, a huge like financial problem um, huge like maybe political instability um, how do you balance that risk and staying financially solvent with um, making sure you still enact some of your programs and trying to keep those promises you made on the campaign trail. I don't, I don't make any promises on the campaign trail, but, but let, let me say, because I haven't, what I've promised to do is clean up the crime, deal with this and deal with the opaqueness and deal with like the budget issues and things like that. But you're correct. I mean, basically we're in bad financial situation right now. Um, you know, we got a uh, hundred... Uh, like $1.4 billion in economic stimulus money to stimulate the economy from the federal government. It all went into debt. So, you know, there are a lot of issues. I mean, while we have a return of people and things like that, we, we don't have the economic wherewithal. I think we lost about 40,000 residents who moved out of this city, taking their tax dollars and everything. We still don't have like our lawyers and folks coming back to pay their wage tax. And then we don't have use and occupancy tax. People are trying to reimagine, like, what am I going to do with this building now? So, so yeah, and that's not going to change. So you're correct. We have a lot of problems, and but our biggest problem, so, so I would say this, you, you kind of have to kind of start a step at a time. The biggest step we have is you got to make the city safe. You can't have a reputation as a city where nobody wants to send their kids to Temple University or Penn or something. Like, like people don't want to come here for business or otherwise investment. So we have to make it safe. You have to show people it's safe. And that would have to do with the areas where we have a lot of crime, murders and all that, because by not responding to them, you're showing you don't care about them. Then we have like center city and all that very important. If we don't have commerce, all that tax falls upon like our residents. That's, very, that's, that's not something we do. We need more investment. We need people to come over. We need to do that. We have areas that we're very good at, you know, creative of our arts economy, um, you know, we have a lot of, uh, you know, the eds and meds things very good. People ask me, and I think today or yesterday, like, what are you going to do about like uh, life sciences? Oh, I don't have to do anything about that. Th that's fantastic. That's through the roof. That's all going great. No attention needed there. Creative arts economy, a lot of attention from the government. And then we have to deal with public transportation, SEPTA. We have to fight with them. And then we have to fight with American Airlines for what they're doing at our airport. Um, but the key to me is if you want people to go to school or to go to outside their house or go to the rec center, mm -hmm. they can't get shot. You know, all that type of thing has to be dealt with. So the first thing is police. We need 1,300, at a minimum, 1,300 new police officers. You know, they have to be supplemented. They have to want to work for our city. They have to be clear on what their job is. But simultaneously, when police show up, street cleaning shows up. Like now that we have police, we can prevent dumping. We can prevent illegal tractor trailers. We can prevent a lot of the problems that prevent people. So the police are there, you know, not to stand as centurions. They're, they're there to enforce your rights, your quality of life and all that. So you could live better. We have, um, yeah, I'm going to have to cut yeah, you. Okay. One last question, please. Yep. Yeah, so um, imagine, okay, yourself as mayor of the city, right? And so my question is, what challenges do you foresee in terms of the work that you are plan on doing in your plans and how they could, how that could be affected by stuff happening at the state level or even the federal level? Well, I mean, for the most part, you know, uh, my interests in the city are pretty much like contained in the city about the fiscal responsibility, about public safety, about streets and roads, of core services. But I have a great interest in going to, you know, to bring investment and opportunities from overseas and in all the categories from technology to, to filmmaking and all that. I, I just see that as something, you know, that is a, a, a lift for our city. The, the, the state, doesn't appear to be a problem for me. Um, um, basically, um, I'm a Republican. I'll talk to Republicans. 
I'm the mayor of one of the biggest democratic seats in this country, and I'll talk to every Democrat too. So there's no Democrat who's going to, you know, do harm to our city. We have a lot of Democrats here and, 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 and in terms of Republicans. So that's really kind of the polarized nature of what's going on in Washington, things like that. There is, um, there, 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 there are new dollars coming up and, um, you know, it's a bid for us to get some of that money. Uh, for example, um, you know, uh, the digital divide. Um, all things related to having uh, the, the type of technology devices and understanding of, of, um, of technology and, and how to access everything in, a, in an equitable way. You know, there's, there's money out there for that. Um, I think there's a infrastructure dollars, all that. So for me, if we don't get wrapped up into some kind of like a fight, partisan fight, um, which is what I, what I would see as mayor, where does this become a problem in, in us getting like um, the kind of uh, funding that we need? Um, the other things don't really impact us too much. Not, not that I see, um, you know, it's just kind of the location where we are. I mean, I, I will, of course, want as much federal dollars as I can get for, for education reform, job training, that type of thing. Uh, me personally, I have a lot to do to work with the state around, you know, I have a very robust idea of what to do with uh, incarcerated citizens and returning citizens. We have uh, 375 Philadelphians who've been incarcerated. That's a lot of people. But if you multiply the number of children that have been impacted by mostly their fathers going to jail and being away, that's a lot of damage. And so kind of like bringing people together you know, helping out with the family, helping them with education, those type of things. I mean, you know, uh, let, let's say the VET program. I can't do a VET program without state authorization. That is a program where basically you identify you want to be certified, like not just career or vocational, you want to be certified in something. And um, you are going through a process where you get an education in that area for like ninth and 10th grade and 11th and 12th, you'll work at Boeing or something, you get paid for that and you get certified. But, but in order for the private industry to pay for all that, uh, for us to actually have like a certain number of hours on the job site with state of the art equipment and all that, that has to be approved uh, by the state. But, but I found the state to be super cooperative in my time on city council, I never had a problem with the state. I once um, asked the state for $10 million of unused tobacco settlement money that we were going to lose anyway to do a teacher reimbursement uh, fund. They said, sure. Um, you know, the fund got defeated here. Where I do fight with the state, by the way, is I fight over the parking authority. I want the parking authority <laughs> back. And the state don't want to give it to us because they're making too much money from us. But that's probably... Well, well on that note, maybe... Yeah, that's a great <laughs> note to end on. Yeah, actually. We all, I think we can all agree that the parking authority is the most hated organization in the city. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, we're, uh, we're yeah, out of time, yeah, but I appreciate that. And I know we didn't get to all uh, design questions, and but, but we did get to broader questions about how do you work with the state and the city and um, yeah, and, and how you're going to govern. So and, and what I don't know. It's important to know what you don't know. Yes, right? I know what I don't know. Yeah. That, we appreciate that. And, and I appreciate the opportunity. Yes, to, thank, to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dag. Okay. I think we went over. Oh, thank really you. Really yeah. enjoyed getting to know you. Oh, thank you. Very much. I'm sorry. We, I think we did sort of go over a little bit, but that's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Listen, I forgot about this microphone. Yeah, better, better. <laughs> <laughs> Those damn dyke people. What the hell?
<laughs> you missed when I jumped in and I ran the before we got on the stage. Oh, really? What's happening?
Yeah. 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 Yeah.